My name is Joris Chizere, uh, and I'm the strategy lead and acting managing director at the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution in Rwanda. My name is Esther Kunda. I'm the director general in charge of innovation and emerging technologies at the Ministry of ICT and Innovation in Rwanda. What's the uh, promise of artificial intelligence in Rwanda? So the promise of AI um, or artificial intelligence, as we like to see, is um, for Rwanda specifically, it's a very promising one. Uh, for the past or more than 20 years now, as a country, we've, um, we've positioned ourselves as an ICT hub where we take technology as one of the cross-cutting um, elements that will fuel our um, our economic growth, right? So when you see emerging technologies, new technologies on the on the global arena coming, it's very imperative that we also um, ensure that we are maximizing the benefits and then uh, that we get out of them, but also ensuring that um, we we are knowledgeable enough and taking the right actions if there, there might be any um, any harm from them. So with, with artificial intelligence specifically, this is a, one of the fastest growing technology uh, worldwide. We've seen applications. I think today, if you're, um, you're on social media, if you're using any type of technology, your phone, then so, there's some sort of artificial intelligence happening um, or implementation that you might be using, whether you are aware of it or not. So that's why, um, that's why for Rwanda specifically this is very important, but also globally we've seen and some of the main research that have, have been done uh, have shown that the economic impact of the is, is tremendous. Um, specifically some of the studies um, portrayed this as um, an economic growth of about 13 trillion to be added on, on the global economy. So that's, that's significant and considering that uh, the entire Africa does not have any significant share of that, uh, it's, 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 in our, um, it's in our goal or even reason for us to be able to harness this, this technology um, as early as possible. You talk about the uh, $13 trillion global, global economic impact potential, mm -hmm. the value at stake, right? Um, so that's, of course, a lot of money. Um, when you see a technology being perversive or getting into becoming ubiquitous, um, as a citizen or even a normal person, you should care about about it. Uh, maybe you might not care about what's the uh, where is it being developed, but you, it's it, it's very good to care and know enough about how it, is it affecting your daily life. With artificial intelligence, what we're seeing is we're seeing um, we're seeing the technology in itself being used um, for climate change, for agriculture, in healthcare and in as many sectors as possible, and especially in how we do communication, right? And, and, and those are some of the critical sectors. Let's say, for example, in agriculture, climate change, um, environment as a whole, these are key sectors that affect every Rwandan. And as well as in some of the public services offerings that are, that are out there in education. Um, so if the way your child is being educated is fundamentally going to change because of the technology, it's very important as, as a citizen to understand the basics, understand how it affects you, and understand how, how it's, it's growing. You've been part in, you, as at the Center of Fourth Industrial Revolution, you've been part of uh, developing this artificial intelligence policy for Rwanda. Why, why do you think Rwanda as a country will need, uh, will need this policy? Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, we need the policy for one main reason, really. Um, I think like you were just talking about, there's uh, clearly a lot of uh, potential impact um, that AI can drive in many different sectors, um, you know, be it agriculture, healthcare, education, like you were mentioning. Um, so one thing is, you know, clearly that impact is there, then you have, to have, you have to ask yourself the question, how do you actually get that impact? So that means a lot of things that have to happen. Uh, there's many interventions that have to happen from a perspective of uh, education, making sure that we're teaching the right skills um, at you know the whole 
uh, value chain, quote unquote, of education, all the way from primary school, high school, university, and so on and so forth. Beyond the core education system, how do you also train existing engineers, for example, existing technology practitioners to be able to uh, also participate in that? Uh, there's many things that have to be done from a, a data perspective, making sure that data is available, can be accessed uh, in a secure way, in a private, uh, in a way that's um, uh, transparent and actually drives uh, impact while minimizing risks. Uh, several things that have to happen from a perspective of infrastructure and so on and so forth. So uh, there's a lot of impact, but many things have to be put in place. Mm -hmm. And so what the policy does is help put a framing around, okay, we want to achieve this impact, and so what do we have to do to achieve that impact? So um, at a high level, the policy really is um, a set of recommendations that uh, should be taken at a national level across all those pillars I was just talking about and more. Um, um, so the policy provides a framing around, okay, these are the key activities we need to be driving at a, um, at a national level. This is how we prioritize those activities. Uh, and, and very importantly, this is who participates uh, in those activities because um, like, uh, like, um, like, and it's clear that AI uh, and other technologies really, it's cross-cutting, enabling type uh, interventions, meaning that they have impacts across uh, many different sectors which then means that you have, uh, you're gonna have uh, involvement for many different actors. Uh, and this is both uh, actors in the public sector, actors in the private sector, uh, but also very, very importantly, actor, actors in the civil society as well. Can you talk to us a little bit about how the policy um, encourages growth and application of AI while mitigating the risk? Like what, what does the policy say about that? I think for this policy, one of the, uh, the premise of, on how it was actually developed was um, to recognize both the benefits, but the potential harm, um, if not well, or the risk, if not well uh, managed. So that's why there's the, the, the ethical guidelines that are, that are attached to it and um, um, that work with it. And, and some of the ethical guidelines that we look at, of course, go with global principles of do no harm, ensure that your data sets that you're using and are not um, are not biased. Uh, you remove bias into the data sets that you you're using. You're inclusive, um, and and everything around really being responsible when you're applying artificial intelligence. So it, it's it's very important that uh, that we as as we embrace these new technology, especially artificial intelligence. It's very very important that. A policy gives premise to 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 managing the risks that are there. So uh, it, across the entire policy, we we are calling out the uh, whether it's in public sector, while uh, in the adoption process and the adoption journey for the public sector and as well as the private sector to really be um, be understanding and be intentional about ensuring that there's no harm done to a Rwandan or even a global citizen who might use a random developed solution, or even a global person, someone from anywhere in the world who brings a solution to Rwanda, will not be, would be intentionally and, apply, and aligning with the, with, the regu with, with the policy to ensure that they're not harming Rwandans as, as, as we adopt these solutions. What should we, I know this is a policy and it's government-led, so this artificial intelligence policy is a government-led, what do you think the larger ecosystem would benefit from this? Um, would benefit from this policy, or even expect um, to see uh, from this policy? What we hope to see again is how do we go from talking about artificial intelligence as a buzzword, as something interesting that everybody's talking about, to actually seeing real, concrete products, services new businesses being created in Rwanda and the region really. Uh, how do we start seeing new businesses around AI being created uh, in the ecosystem? How do we start seeing uh, private companies use AI in their value chains? How do we start seeing the government uh, use AI in the different uh, public services that they're offering? So um, one thing that we are scoping out right now is uh, we're, design, we're designing a uh, national AI innovation uh, and research program. Essentially, the premise of that is um, we've done a landscape analysis of some applications that we think are interesting, uh, that we think are contextual, are interesting for the for the for the local context and regional context. 
Uh, again, looking at some of these key sectors like agriculture, you know, specific applications that we can apply there, um, healthcare, specific applications that we can apply there. So we've done a landscape analysis of some of these uh, use cases. And the next step that we are, you know, going to be doing is how do we then work with uh, uh, the local innovation ecosystem, be it uh, innovation hubs like Norskin, where we're sitting right now, uh, or um, a lot of the local universities, which we have a lot of uh, interesting uh, and high caliber programs uh, in the country already and in the region that we can take advantage of. So I think uh, what we hope to see, broadly speaking, is um, how do we you know, work with the innovation community, with the universities, uh, other innovators like I was talking about to uh, create, you know, concretely create applications products and services in AI that can address some of our biggest challenges and opportunities. So I think that's that's really ultimately what we hope to see uh, in the in the in the economy, in the ecosystem. Maybe something else that I can add is around um, how artificial intelligence is going to change how we work mm -hmm. and basically how we interact with our jobs. Yeah. Right? Um, if I don't think there's a job that AI is not going to affect. And when I say affect, it doesn't mean necessarily bad. Mm -hmm. But I, I think especially for employers, it's very, very important to think about, even for people who are currently working, to think about reskilling themselves. Um, sometimes we're so used to doing one job and we understand one way of doing our job. But with artificial intelligence, because it's changing your day-to-day -day or how you were interacting with your job, I think it's very important that we really maximize and understand stand what's the next level when artificial intelligence is now part of your day-to-day -day life. I believe a few years back we were, no one understood that a phone or an email could be an official document, WhatsApp could be an official way of communicating through work. So the same way we've adopted those, those technologies as part of our day-to-day -day work is the same way we're now going to have to readapt our different jobs to now include the different parts that AI uh, helps us in, helps us or is going to be used in. So rethinking about how our different jobs are going to be affected and reskilling ourselves. So for both employees and people who are currently in the workforce, I, I believe this is something to pay attention. Yeah, no, I'm glad you bring that up. I was, uh, I was at a conference uh, recently where somebody said, um, AI is not really gonna uh, replace people. Um, instead what's gonna happen is, professionals, people that use AI, are gonna replace those that don't use AI. So a lawyer who uses AI or a doctor who uses AI in their, in their work uh, is gonna replace a lawyer or a doctor who doesn't use AI. And that's, that's very true because uh, when you look at a lot of these interesting applications that are coming up, it just gives you, um, you know, the, the level of productivity gains and efficiency gains that it can provide uh, allow us to do a lot more than we were able to do before. Um, and still on this point, actually, so I was just talking about, um, you know, specific applications that we hope to see being built, right? Be it uh, in agriculture, be it in healthcare, education, and so on and so forth. But when you actually st take a step back, right, um, there's the broader AI value chain. So there's a lot of things that are happening for you to see an actual product uh, on the market. So um, somebody is preparing the data, um, you know, somebody is doing the computing infrastructure around that, uh, somebody is writing the program, um, somebody has to audit uh, the program, for example. So you can imagine, and by audit I mean like, you know, from the regulatory pieces, for example, how do you make sure that uh, this model performs in the way that it claims to perform? Um, how do you ensure that um, it's transparent or safe or trustworthy as it claims to, to be? So there's very many, you can imagine there's very many different other, um, uh, what's the word, other professionals or, or categories of jobs uh, that um, you know AI as an industry is gonna create. So there's, there's the application pieces which are going to drive real direct impact to the average uh, Rwandan, the average African, but then there's also just the whole value chain that gets created to get that application to market. So it's very interesting to see um, the potential impact, tangible impact, but also the potential market creation impact uh, the AI will potentially bring to us. Who does the policy relate to and, and who do you think are the key stakeholders for this to be successful? Um, for the policy to be successful, some the main key stakeholders, I would say the first one is the, is the Rwandan citizen um, uh, across and really that um, 
I'll say that awareness of what this policy is doing and what the technology in itself is about and its applications. Um, of course, as government, it's our job to make sure that we're raising this awareness with different other people. But I think the Rwandan citizen is, is, is the first key and the person it relates to most. Secondly, um, the government of Rwanda as a whole. So uh, when we talk about artificial intelligence and you've talked about the key elements of of the policy, we're talking about scaling. So that's education, employment, um, lab, so that touches on labor laws and, and et cetera. Um, we also look at, uh, when we look at um, a robust data strategy, it's very important that uh, different institutions that are holders of data uh, start utilizing them, uh, even enabling us to create an open data ecosystem. Uh, within the country. Um, the research community, the acad academia is very important because I believe without creation of knowledge in the space, um, we will be stagnant in what we know and what how we can utilize it for, for our benefit. Um, and, and, and lastly, um, and of course, our key development partners in, in all areas. Um, as we continue to talk about technologies cross-cutting, whether you're in, in agriculture, health, education, etc., it is very important that we continue to work with our existing partners, the partners that helped us even when we are crafting the policy, to continue really understanding how does this um, affect and benefit um, the Rwandan citizen on a day-to-day -day basis. Give me at the moment two application. One is like a cool application, an AI application that is really cool, that you think is cool. Second, one that you think is transformational in a way. One thing that we're actively scoping out right now is um, creating some sort of um, um, a chatbot, so an interactive voice response system they call it IVR, which is basically um, a phone number you can call and you can ask it many different information about agriculture. So it could be, um, you know, what's the weather gonna be like tomorrow? Um, it's going to be raining, and if so, what advice would you give me? So you can imagine as a farmer who is um, somewhere, you know, uh, in, in Rwanda, you want some information around what the season is going to look like, uh, and beyond information around either pests or weather, you also want some information around actionable advice um, that you could apply given that information. Um, so this is a tool that you can interact with in Kenya, Rwanda, using voice uh, to be able to get access to that information. Uh, and again, it's it's uh, basically all broad information around agriculture. It could be uh, farming practices, it could be um, national programs that are being run by the ministry or RAB, uh, it could be, you name it, any agriculture related information you can interact with, uh, uh, with this tool. So you can imagine um, that also helps, again, democratize access to information to the farmer so they don't have to wait uh, for the uh, agronomy to come to the area for them to ask uh, questions. Um, so, so that could be very, very impactful. Another really interesting uh, application that uh, we're exploring is um, there's, uh, you know, of course, inputs. Um, so inputs here mean fertilizer, water, and so on and so forth um, are typically uh, scarce or expensive uh, for the average farmer. Uh, so it's very, very important that they are very effective with how they uh, they apply it, both in terms of uh, minimizing a cost to them, but also helping them apply input where it's most needed so they can increase and maximize their yield. Um, so there's a lot of applications we're seeing where um, you can read satellite images um, and combine that information with sensors you can put in the soil. So you have a bunch of sensors that can read many different things about the soil, um, things like concentration of, of, of nitrogen, so fertilizer in the soil, uh, whether it's concentration of water in the soil. Um, so you can imagine combining satellite images, which can then read sort of like uh, the different layers of the soil, combining it with this data from the sensors. You can literally tell a farmer that in this area of your, of your plot, uh, put fertilizer, you need it. In this other area of your plant, maybe you're okay. You should actually apply water instead. Um, so with doing that, you can, you know, this essentially moving towards precision agriculture, like the Ministry of Agriculture has been championing. Uh, you can imagine that you can use technology, again, via those sensors and satellite images to really um, direct farmers with exactly what they should do in what part of their field, uh, which again would help them minimize uh, input costs to them but also helping them increase yields in the long run as they're applying 
inputs where they're most needed. So a lot of very cool and interesting potential Great. transformational Great. applications. Fantastic. Thank you, Joris. Thank, Thank you, you Esther. Time. Absolutely. Good, good. Thank you.